So architecture is art, but it's also communication because we're trying to create art, which is buildings, but we need to explain it as architects and building designers, and interior designers, and landscape designers. We create architecture, but we don't build it physically. We get other people to build it for us, generally speaking. And so we need to communicate how to build it. Now, we have a, a few different methods of communication because we're communicating ideas and commonly we'll be communicating those ideas through presentation methods. So we're trying to explain the beauty of the architecture. And so we're using models or photo renders or other artistic impressions, often 3D drawings, to try to explain that to people that maybe are not able to read plans. The technical method. And that's what I want to talk about today, that technical method of communicating architecture. We call it architectural documentation. We're specifically trying to talk to builders in this instance because builders, or contractors as we call them, are the people who end up building the architecture. So we need to have a very specific language in which we speak. Part of that language is drawings and the graphic representation of drawings, but it's also written language, but it's not necessarily written language as we'd read in a book. It's a very succinct method. So we call these annotations and specifications. We're writing, but we're writing in a formal way, and we're tr trying to communicate very specific ideas using words that relate to the industry. So this image that I'm showing you at the moment is a great example of how this has been done for a very long time. A very classical way of annotating drawings. This drawing is by Glenn Merkett, who's a famous Australian architect. The project is called the Simpson Lee House. And as you will notice, this drawing is completely drafted manually or by hand. And as we zoom in, we can see that all of the text is also hand drafted. So as you can hopefully appreciate, I certainly appreciate it, there's a huge amount of work that goes into this. Now this isn't the whole project, right? This is one drawing in a much larger set. And this isn't a little drawing. We're not talking about an A4 drawing or even an A3 drawing. We're talking about more like an A1 or A0 sized page in order to be able to convey this much information. In this case, Glenmark, it's putting a huge amount of work and a huge amount of information into this building and hopefully the builder can read it all, understand it all, and be able to interpret this in order to be able to construct the project. But my concern is, if I look at this, wow, that's a lot of work. Is there a better way to do that? Is there a simpler way to do that? What would happen if I wrote all of those notes on that page, which as you can see, those annotations are filling up the entire page. They're not on the outside of the section, which would be nice and clean. They're inside the section, they're over the section, they're outside the section, they're covering the whole page. And that is a little bit messy. It's, it's a pretty well-organized drawing, but it's pretty messy in that it's very, very busy. Now what would happen, as tends to be the case, if the client changed their mind and they wanted to change the shape of the house, the layout, the height of the roof, the slope of the roof, or the materiality of any of these, any of these elements, the walls, the floors, the roofs, the windows, the chimney. All of these elements being expressed in this drawing would need to change. And when we do this manually by hand, what does that mean? We either need to redraw the whole thing, or we need to maybe scratch it out and try to draw over the top, or photocopy and white out and then draw over the top. So doing this manually is a lot of hard work. Even if we were doing this digitally, because the way this is annotated, it's not referenced annotation or an acronym annotation or a label annotation, which I'm going to talk about later. The concern is because it's fully annotated, it's written out in sentences or paragraphs, even if they are condensed, I'm showing this on one section, but I'd have to repeat some of this information on other sections and other elevations and other plan views. And what would happen 
is if then I wrote it all out. Again, it would take a long time to do. But what happens if I had to make a change? I wouldn't be making that change once. I'd have to make that change multiple times. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. But more concerningly, how do I manage that well? How do I ensure that it's consistent? And this is where we get large problems with this methodology of working and something that we really want to try to do in a better way, a more managed way, more a quality assured way, particularly when we're using BIM, building information modeling. Because instead of manually annotating, we really want the computer to be able to do as much of that for us and hopefully try to avoid making mistakes in that process. We're starting with a site plan. Often when we're talking about a full set of documentation, we're starting from a macro scale, zoomed all the way out, and then we start to zoom in on the finer detail. So here we see the site. It's a large house on a relatively large site. In fact, it's a long site, but it's very narrow, and that means that the house is quite limited in the way that it's fitting onto the site. It's also a very steep site, so we'll see that it spans over multiple stories. We're including the original survey with elements shown that are being demolished. So there's an existing house, an existing pool and shed, and they're all being demolished to make way for the new dwelling. This diagram's explaining that the house is actually built over five stories, pool and cabana, lower ground floor, which is mostly living spaces, upper ground floor, which is bedrooms, first floor, which is garage and entry and in fact these aren't even on the same story either so in fact it's sort of six levels and then there's a, a roof a green roof or a garden roof over the garage and the roof over the entry we see we're zoomed in again so now we're starting to look at each of the floor plans now we could read this or represent this in a few different ways we could start from the top and go down or we could start from the bottom and go up I've chosen to do that method the second bottom up because in terms of construction, that's normally the way that we build it. We'd normally start from the bottom and then work our way back up the stories or up the hill in this instance. When we're designing and detailing or documenting large projects, we also need a way of setting it out. So we see that there's a grid system and those grid systems are reading numerically from left to right. We see on this particular story, we're only looking at grids from four to eight and then we have a alphabetical system a b c d e going down the page in order to be able to locate all of the elements and so we're dimensioning to the grids the grids help us set out between stories and between major elements and then we dimension to those and what you're starting to see on the right hand side which i'll zoom in later is all of the annotations that relate to these plans. And so there's a code, a label, and then a legend which is describing what each of those codes mean. And then this is in turn relating to a material schedule which we'll look at later. Because this is a sizable project, there's already lots of information on every drawing. And so what we'll find as we go through this set is we'll be repeating the same types of drawing, but we'll be repeating it multiple times with new layers of information. So these drawings at the moment that we're looking at, I would call general arrangement plans. They're showing the arrangement of the space. They're dimensioning the set out of the walls, and they're giving major references when that's necessary to show more detail. In this case, particularly a lot of bubble references that are referencing to interior design work. Of course, like I said before, interior design and landscape design both are components of architecture. And so as an architect, I'm working with other consultants, other designers, in order to be able to make the whole of the architecture work. And in this particular instance, it's also my job to coordinate, collaborate with those other consultants and coordinate their work for construction. So here we have two sections. We actually have multiple sections cut through this building, but let's just focus on one of them for now. And we'll see that this view is neither as detailed or as full of information as the Glenn Merkert drawing that we were looking at before. 
But instead, it focuses on bringing into perspective smaller details. And so it's referencing details, which then you pursue, you go and find that page, and then you look at them in more detail. So these are only 1 to 100, which means they're too small on a drawing to be able to identify much more information. So this is showing the, the whole set out of the section, showing the relationship between stories and the critical heights. And then it's required that we skip through the pages and we can view each of these detailed elements in much, much more detail. So in this particular instance, we're looking at an eave detail or our box gutter detail. So we're seeing how the roof sheeting falls into the box gutter. We have a structural frame, a piece of steel. We call this a parallel flange channel, which in this case is boxed out with smaller timber framing and then clad so we don't read it as an empty piece of steel. That was based on the client's directive. We're using cross laminated timber, so a large solid chunk of timber, a, a big panel as the main structural element of the roof. We're then battening out or creating purlins above this Insulating, the wall is made of concrete. CPF is the note that's given here. So concrete permanent form. In this case, we're using a dinsel product. So the concrete formwork, the plastic shell is permanent. It doesn't get taken away or stripped away at the end, but it allows the concrete something solid to cure in. And then of course, once the concrete is dry, the concrete becomes incredibly strong. But concrete's not very good at thermal performance. So we've battened out the concrete on the outside and added an external insulated facade. In this case, we're using a Unitex baseboard product, which means it's already got a mesh on the outside, which makes it more resilient, stronger. And then that is finished with an acrylic render. And then we will have material schedules. And these are the fuller annotations, or the equivalent of the fuller annotation, which are describing each of those products and explaining how they work. All of those labels are then referenced here to the material schedule, and then they're referenced further than this into the specifications. So this system, while resulting in 45 pages of documentation, all at A1, so they're very large, of course, this is a fairly large project, so it needs to have so many pages. But because we're working in BIM, sometimes it's easier to have multiple pages, each with less information on them, which means the information is more clearly displayed than overcomplicating less pages. Because to reproduce the base drawing when you're using BIM is quite easy. The work is in the extra layering the extra detailing, which needs to be done anyway. But in this case, it allows it to be represented more cleanly and spread over multiple pages. Is there an area of Archicad that you would like to learn or have a question answered? Become a patron of Archicad and request a video. I'll personally provide you with a tutorial answering your question and you will be contributing to our global learning community. Request a video today at Archicad.